<clears throat> I think that is my cue to begin. Um, good afternoon, um, guests. Good morning. Good evening from wherever you are joining us. My name is Wayne Modest, and I am the Director of Content at the National Museum of World Cultures in the Netherlands. And today, more specifically, I am here for one of our museums within the National Museum Group, and that is the Tropa Museum. As some of you may know, the National Museum is formed from th three museums, and we work together with the World Museum in Rotterdam. In the National Museum of World Cultures, we have the Museum of the Tropa Museum and the African Museum. Today is a special day for us, a special conversation that we will have with an artist who become a companion with us as we think about a certain kind of collaborative future making. Today, 14th of June, 2021 is the beginning of what is called Refugee Week. For this theme of Refugee Week, I want to read a little bit of the quote that comes from the webpage of this, um, this, this year's um, commemoration or marking. Quoting a moment in Martin Luther King's um, speeches, the I Have a Dream speech, the website says they have come to realize that their freedom is inextricably bounded to our freedom. And he continues, we cannot walk alone. It is with this, we cannot walk alone, that we invited Isam Kurdabash to be a companion with us, to think more critically about not just Refugee Week and not just the context or idea of how people become refugees, what is at stake in the notion of a refugee, but also more closely to an idea about how do we, are we implicated in these global practices of displacement, of crises, of war that create refugees out of some people in the world. And on the other side, another kind of implicatedness in how we as institutions, but as humans in this world who live in this world with others, not only think about questions of the refugee where we often tie words to it in the last four years in, the, in Europe anyway, or five years or 10 years of crisis, problem, but rather think of ourselves as part of what it might mean to provide refuge for, to be hospitable, to think again about another kind of world where the global catastrophes, the catastrophes of wars do not make some people precarious again and again and again. Isam is an artist who I met probably two years ago, I think. It was in the beginning of 2020, actually. We met at the University of Pennsylvania to think more critically about the role that cultural institutions, heritage institutions can play in thinking about the histories of, of violent um, displacement, the histories of making refugees of people, the histories of war. And what is at stake in the museum work to try and make those, um, those acts of violation speakable, but how can museums participate in this notion of refugee? Interestingly enough, when we met just prior to that moment, Isam had met Sarah Johnson, our curator of Middle East and North Africa in the Trovo Museum, together with our head of the cura chief curator, Henrietta Leachy. That was a happenstance. It was serendipity that those two things happened. 
And when I came back, I heard about his son. A year, and a year later, or a year and a half later, we now have an exhibition in the Tropo Museum in our light hall that addresses the very themes that we were discussing at UPenn. A complex entanglement of objects of Isam's own work brought together with the Tropo Museum's collection as well as collections from other museums in the Netherlands or other institutions in the Netherlands. Curated, intervened in the museum as a context of the colonial. Today, we're going to talk about that. What does it mean to intervene in an institution like ours? What is at stake in bringing the work of a contemporary artist together with a museum regarded as ethnographic? What might it mean to think more critically about the concept of the ethnographic in relationship to the concept of natural history? And how do those different epistemic formations help us to understand the world we live in differently? Or how might bringing those two epistemic formations help us to think differently about questions of refugees, the displaced, dispersal? And how might museums become a part of thinking these things more urgently and critically. So for an hour, we will have this discussion and I am going to be only your moderator today. It is going to be for Isam to show you his work, to enter into dialogue with Sarah, and for me to try and pull out some of the questions. In my moderation, I would like to ask you to put your questions in the chat and I will mediate them for Isam and, and for Sarah so that they can answer. Before moving on though, I just want to read a little bit about Isam. And Isam Kurbash comes from a background of fine arts, architecture and theater design. He was born in Swaida in Syria and trained at the Institute of Fine Arts in Damascus, the Repin Institute of Fine Arts and Architecture in Leningrad in St. Petersburg, Russia, and at the Wimbledon School of Arts, London. Since 1990, he has lived and worked in Cambridge, where he has been artist in residence, a BY fellow, BYE, and lecturer in art at Christ College at the University of Cambridge. Since 2011, Kurbash has been dedicated to raising awareness for projects and aid in Syria through several exhibitions, installations, and performances in the UK and abroad. Today, we're going to talk about the exhibition, which actually I, has for me two names, Scaling the Dark, and I'll tell, explain that later on, and Fleeing the Dark. Sarah can explain the intricacies of it, but I wanted to introduce both terms because for me, they say something else, and I'd like to bring that out in the conversation. Isam, Sarah. Um, First, I want to invite Sarah Johnson to perhaps introduce you to the work itself and introduce you to um, Isam, which will be followed by Isam doing a short presentation and they will open up into a conversation. Sarah, over to you. Thank you, Wayne, for that introduction. Um, I would just like to briefly, I will give the floor mainly to Isam, but just explain a little bit about how our collaboration came about. So I actually met Isam in 2015 on a boat in London. We were, uh, <laughs> we were, I was there to see his um, exhibition Another Day Lost, um, which was also a memorial to um, the crisis going on in Syria and um, in refugees. Um, and I was immediately struck by his work, um, but we didn't meet again until he was here in the Netherlands to look um, at uh, herbarium in Naturalis um, in another institution. So our meeting was also a bit by chance um, and I invited him to come to our museum to look at some objects um, and to meet. Um, and what immediately struck me when we went together to the depot was first of all, the kinds of objects Isam was interested in. Um, so uh, he was often interested in um, very um, 
uh, humble objects, um, not complicated um, objects to me that didn't shout. Um, and also he was really, the way he looked at objects really struck me. So um, he was very interested um, and appreciated the making of objects where that kind of appreciation didn't often come to them. And I thought that way of looking was really important for our institution, our museum. Um, and so that led me to um, ask Isam if he would be interested in intervening. Um, and that led to a long, um, year long discussion back and forth where we threw uh, different themes uh, at each other and came up with objects that might um, tell important stories related to uh, messages that Isam was trying to share. Um, and I also thought that the way he looked at our collection was really important on a broader scale um, to speak to um, and to demand uh, from the visitor to look and to pay attention um, to the situation going on, uh, both in Syria and um, the uh, refugee crisis that that then uh, created. So. Um, I hope that he can explain it better and further. And so I will give the floor now to Isam Korbaj. And um, yes. Lovely. And here I am. Now, I don't know if you are able to. Yes, we're here but to see you. Oh, Excellent, great. excellent, great. Um, thank you very much, um, Wayne. And thank you very much, Sarah. I really appreciate um, two things. I appreciate your beautiful introduction and the idea of walking together. It's actually, I will remember that because it's, it's such a very powerful metaphor to work together. Um, and at the same time, I would like to um, thank you for inviting me. So um, what about if I will share now my screen? And I will put my, uh, where is my screen? If I could find it, of course. It is, let me, mm -hmm. no, it looks like I am not going to find it easy. So I have to dig a little bit to find it. So here it is. Are you able to see my screen or not yet? Not yet. Here it is now. Can you able to see my screen? We are not seeing it yet, Sam. So. I see. Oh, I see. I, what about if I would share? Yes. Uh, yes. Perfect. Excellent. Now, but it's the wrong, the wrong, the wrong um, slide. So I would just bring it here. It is. Here I am. Okay. So the second thing I wanted to thank you for this wonderful invitation. What a great opportunity for a visual artist to be offered this beautiful collection, and I mean beautiful. I will come back to that, what I mean by beautiful. And equally, this beautiful whole and conversation, because we had such a very long conversation with this project. So thank you for inviting me for curating and intervening in, in, um, um, in a way that is, I understand that is you had some past experiences with contemporary art, and I am very delighted to be part of this conversation. So I will go through the way I was uh, working with this question of um, question of actually in 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 many ways a very big question is to do with our lives in many ways and you will see the way how I am playing with the question of seeds as well as the question of refugee and um, and making this kind of stories coming together you will judge how successful I was when maybe you visited not uh, online, but when you visited um, in real life. So let me let me start, and we will take it from there. So my first attempt to share with you is the minute you are entering the light hall, you will be greeted with this diagonal. This is my, if you like, intervention. It is a very strong diagonal, and you will be. Um, invited to look a little bit up to see a hanging door. Um, actually, not a door, it is a half a door, and it happened to be from Aleppo. And that half a door has another half fallen. And that fallen 
door or half door and half the other one fallen, I am using as, if you like, a border between the outside and the inside, between um, what is in front of our skin, what is in the back of our skin, the idea of home. But actually my story does not start from that door. It is, I am teasing the viewer and I am always like the idea that is the viewer have their own journeys and I'm, I accept whatever journeys they will take. But this is my journey, the way I curated it with her. So my journey starts with the cycle of life. And actually the cycle of life, if you see it in your right hand side, there is a very beautiful pot from a bowl from Syria. But what attracted me is this modesty of this, this humble uh, plate. But look at the drawing carefully. You will see the seed became a flower. The flower became a fruit and the fruit bear another seed and cycle of life goes on. And what a very, I mean, the humbleness of it attracted me very much. But this cycle of life is in threat. And I use this, it's literally a very beautiful seed from Syria. It is an authentic work. Um, and it is a threat by this razor blade with the graffiti um, of my poem, leave to remain a single Syrian grain airborne, which I might touch later on. So this is the essence of my starting point. Where I take you as a, as a visitor, I will take you to different parts of playing with the question of darkness as a nurturing place or as a destructive place. And um, I'm using lockdown as a, as a, we are all going through this ongoing issues with the, with the pandemic. But I was really struck by this beautiful object, very meaningful object in many ways. It's called spring lock. I mean, it cannot be better object to, to, um, to react against. Um, and it is because it's spring and I am dealing with the question of seeds and lock, we are dealing with lockdown. And if you see my very humble uh, response to it, and it is a tiny small peg, um, but it's lost its spring and the spring is being trapped. And this is my lockdown. And if I take you back a little bit, as Wayne was talking about that I am coming from many different disciplines, one of my interests as a visual artist is this kind of conversation. Uh, we cannot walk together. It is actually having these two objects conversing together, what kind of message they send. Now, I will take you to another very beautiful object. Um, there is this, a toy car, a very humble car, um, made by a child in Libya in the 50s. And what attracted me is actually, it brought my memory, of course, of my childhood. This is the way I used to um, make my own toys. So this activities of um, it just, it's really great to see another companion um, in the 50s um, that was thinking in the same vein. Um, but of course, um, as Sarah was talking about earlier, this is, of course, one needs to pay attention to the details of what is it's made of. I didn't ask this question. I was really interested in the way how a child beautify their being by creating their own toys. It's almost like it becomes the making of the object. It becomes a tool to, to transport you to another place, to another real uh, re reality that is of joy and that really interested me so my reaction to that one was another toy it's called steering crutch and of course the crutch is relating to the war and the way how many Syrian and many other nations children have to to somehow deal with their own childhood and with the uh, with bearing this idea of um, visible and invisible scars with them. And I, as you see, there is another piece actually, it's called soulless. And I really, I really feel that is this is the walking together. Um, and we have seen many, many people throughout history, they walk together as, as, a, as if you like, um, somehow supporting each other. And in this particular place, I have been using it 
as a performance as the opening. So I am just going to share with you this one minute um, performance and you will see the way what I have done to this 10 years old child. And I should thank the child who donated it because it is it was very meaningful in many, in two ways that it is a 10 years old uh, piece because it's the 10th ten, anniversary of the Syrian uprising. And it is a child and you will see what I'm doing to it. Actually, I'm undoing it rather than doing it. It's called Solace. And actually, um, I must admit, it is I have I went through a few different knives that, that night. Um, I feel sorry for the border police that they have to do this to many refugees who attempted to travel to Europe. And the message was very clear, Europe is nowhere. But what is actually greeting you as you enter the light hall? is this very big installation. It's called, here it is. It's called Scaling the Dark, Seeds, Sands, and Moons. And I am just going to share with you a few things with them. It is, these are actually made out of three different kinds of boats, 122 big boats, one for each month of since the Syrian uprising. And that particular object actually was chosen in December 2020 as object 101 as part of the history of the world and 100 object. Now it is 101 object. And I felt actually this is a huge responsibility to make, to make a, an object as a historic object. So, and the second part of this installation is 532 medium size carrying sand that is, was once a stone that was once architecture and destructed architecture. And the, the last one is actually, it is a small boat, 3,727 3, um, of them, each of them carrying one chart seed. And again, this is a calendar actually. And that calendar is what I am really interested in, creating this kind of ongoing waiting, waiting of, if you like, between two different places, between yourself being in struggle and where to go with that struggle. Now, this is, I am inviting the, the viewer to come back to another, at least, to experience what it means to be under strike by only my, my humble matches. Um, so this is a performance, you will see it projected on the floor, and you will see in front of it a, a piece called Don't Wash Your Hands with other pieces. Actually, that piece is uh, made out of Aleppo soap, but you will see objects from um, uh, the Archaeology Museum in Leiden, which is really great to see the way how the conversation between these objects. And when you are invited further, in the diagonal to see the herbarium. And so the whole room here is actually dedicated to the herbarium and the question of um, these plants that is very well troubled. And this one particularly, it is a Syrian poppy that is, it grows on rocks in rough terrain. So a very symbolic thing. But what actually equally interested me that is these, these plants have roots. And this is what I am really interested in, that question of roots. So that, that particular corner of the installation is to do with seeds, roots, and plants. And here it is, seeds towards. I am playing with the question of um, modern medis medicine and the lack of it with a Morse code called SOS. Or in Arabic, actually, it is uh, to do with Arabic dots has almost like seeds. So the lack of seeds, uh, the lack of dots, it's a lack of seeds 
because many of the seeds in Syria were actually burnt. And I'm using this beautiful manuscript in Arabic. Um, and what it's really attracted me to this particular page, it's to do with the verb to do um, and to fulfill, to act. And actually it is a very ironic page because this is, was the, the lack of the international community of what is happening currently in Syria. Um, I'm using a very beautiful poem by Mahmoud Darwish, the Palestinian uh, poet called The Damascian Color of the Dove. And here it is actually close up. I am really interested in specimens. So these are specimens of destruction um, of different cities and people in Syria. So this is if you, I, I bring close up to this. And again, another specimen is, is the herbarium. Another specimen is the writing in Arabic. So these are almost a scientific object in many ways, but these are a palimpsest of different layers. And particularly this uh, line of the poem that I really would like to read. In Damascus, a bird picks at what remains of wheat in my hand and leaves me a single grain to show me my tomorrow, tomorrow. Now, the last thing I am toward the end of my presentation, what you see in the beginning is a calendar, what you see in the end is another calendar, Almanac. And as you see, there is a tally um, with burnt matches. Um, actually, I just noticed another thing, object which is very prominent, is the fire extinguisher in the back. I thought it's very appropriate to be part of the conversation, how much we need actually fire e extinguishers in many conflicts part of the world. And here is a child diary with another day lost. And actually, if you see the dates, they are broken because many childhood is actually damaged and we need many, many generations of many children that they need to really work very hard to, to overcome this trauma. Um, and the last thing you see in the exhibition is Almanac from Iran, very beautiful object. You will see the catalog actually, hopefully it will be ready in the museum soon and you will see how many interesting things inside. it. But I would like to leave you with this particular slide. One day when I was installing, I saw this very beautiful object, object actually, it's not a, an object at all. It is a living heron, gray heron, I think. Um, guarding these beautiful, um, if you like, sprouting seeds from Syria. And this is a wonderful intervention by the Royal Tropical Institute outside the museum, where you see actually a living object in front of your eyes. These seeds are growing outside and the heron is guarding them. I really like that heron and I really appreciate his effort or her effort for that matter. But I would love that the world is actually made out of many of these birds and many of these people which is they guard life and they guard growth because we are different and this is the magic about us so this is where i am at and i look forward now to see what kind of conversations we are going to have thank you very much and i am just going to stop my stop sharing my okay here i am are you able to hear me now yes here it is lovely here i am Thank you, Isam. Um, not only able to hear you, but there is so much beauty, beauty in, in everything you said. Um, I, I actually don't even know where to start. I love the idea that you ended with, the idea of guarding life mm -hmm. and what it is to guard life. And the heron, that, and that's actually a good place perhaps to end again, because that's what I meant when I started out with the question, not of the refugee, but of refuge. Mm -hmm. And what might it mean that we guard as a space for refuge, for life itself, and not necessarily participate in death creation? So let's, let's, let's hold on to that. But I want to open up with a much more um, simple question. Um, because there is something about the, the simplicity. I mean, Sarah, this question is going to come to you as well. Your engagement with things with small objects, with mundane things sometimes one could suggest, and your attempt to see the beauty of those mundane things as you engage with them. And they're, the way they become a certain kind of monumental, so the boat, your boat becomes something that is significant, one of the iconic objects of our current moment. Um, can you speak a little bit about that, that relationship between 
the, the work that you try to do and the everydayness of the objects which animate your practice. Beautiful. Um, I will start with that, Sarah, and I will, I will just, because I just noticed behind you, and you have another boat. And it is interesting the way how it is. <laughs> you see, you cannot escape my me referring. <laughs> so, yes. Um, yes. Actually, you see, this is where I was saying to Sarah that is what actually attracts me to people uh, when I am teaching. I am really interested in the people that is they don't show themselves immediately, but actually only when you invest listening and looking, suddenly you see much deeper level. And I found that is... Um, when I was visiting your museum, um, and um, we were we were visiting uh, many many objects, but of course always there is, if you like, um, there is object that is they gain agency because their modesty, and I found that agency that is interests me, uh, the material, the shape, the drawings. I mean, that plate, I think that is, I, I don't know who has done it, but I would love to meet the person who has done that plate and the way how it is such a, such a very visual poetry. This is what I am really interested in. But of course, um, because I am interested in recycling and the way how revisiting object that is already, they lost their voice, somehow to re-energize them, to have it re reconverse with them. So th they fit very nicely for me to actually taking something that is, it's not loud, but actually having that kind of mute voice is speaking much louder somehow. So I will, I will now um, give the microphone to you, sir. Yes, sir. And, and I, I just wanted to follow up on that, right? Because um, if you were as a curator, you know, in that, in that engagement with, with Isam, uh, what were some of the interesting moments for you as he engaged with the collection? You know, what, 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 what fascinated you? What came out that you said, oh, I didn't see this before? What yeah, is I the think... artistic engagement that inspired you? Right. Yeah, I think uh, what's exactly what you're saying about the mundane and the simplicity of objects, because actually what really interested me is that's part of the reason they were collected, but um, what Isam does is he shows them in their own right because they were collected in the everyday and then they were displayed in a very crowded way. So, for example, the doors that um, Isam curated in his own way and he actually creates it as a kind of art piece. And this was perhaps the most experimental and the bravest thing uh, that we did as a museum is to let him do this, um, to actually incorporate those objects into his own um, display but the way he does it is very it forces you to look at that object and what we did in the past when we would display for example those doors we created a kind of fake setting with lots of objects together and that's why um, that we sort of created a, a home in Aleppo. Um, but in that setting, it was very crowded and distracting. And Isam kind of took that all away and just focused on those doors. Um, and I thought, to me, that was really beautiful and made you completely rethink um, these kind of collections. So, yeah. um, but mm -hmm. also for me, what I would love Isam to get into more is the, if we're talking about not walking alone, is the way he forced everyone to work together in new ways um, within um, different institutions. So you showed the seeds, um, but I would love for you to, maybe if you want to explain more how we started to grow wheat plants on the <laughs> Trope and Cafe terrace. Um, I think that's a really beautiful moment of a lot of people coming together and um, Isam is, and his practice is kind of also about that bringing together, which we can only see now through the, the finished product. If you remember, actually, Sarah, what you have done, the, I was telling you, I would love to be in, in your museum when the museum is open its door. And the first image you sent me is actually a moving image, a conversation between parents and children. And the children are taking <laughs> the parents for a walk rather than the other way around through the museum. And I felt that is that togetherness, it's absolutely very vital. That is the way how that kind of, it's not anywhere you go to see this, 
I mean, I have done many objects with antiquity, but actually these, these objects, this is where we were working together. It, they are very ordinary, everyday object. And this is the magic. This is exactly the magic. But of course, when we were discussing a few things and thinking about inviting other, um, another, other organizations, I think that is the choice of the herbarium, which was, I mean, what a privilege to have the herbarium. I know that is, it is a huge, if you like, step you have taken with me, and I hope that is, you will not regret it by the end of October. You will not have the visitors complaining, what have you done to the Tropen Museum? M maybe the opposite, you will have a very new, if you like, conversation with the visitors. And having this kind of interdisciplinarity of the object coming from scientific, if you like, background, such as the herbarium, or the archaeology museum in, in Leiden, or the, I mean, having that living part of, of um, if you remember, we were thinking about having it in the botanical garden, but thanks to, to uh, Wayne, um, and he suggested why not to speak with, with our colleagues at, at, um, at the kit. Um, and this was a very nice, fruitful conversation to have these seeds growing outside. So there is, there is, it's, I don't claim at all that is, this is only me. This is a, all of us together, thinking together. And this is what happened, if you remember in the installation, everybody came, everybody wants to work, everyone but to suggest. I felt actually it was not, I mean, it, I felt so humbled by the amount of positive energy coming from everybody to make this as, as meaningful to everybody. So... We were all walking together. <laughs> <laughs> no, and I must admit that um, the response from the Royal Tropical Institute was quite quick in their response about not knowing what the possibilities are, but we're going to try. And so that was quite, quite, quite beautiful to see how that worked. I, I, I want to just um, 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 to go back to that, that idea just for the last thing, because I think that we should spend some time with objects. Mm -hmm. We don't spend enough time with objects sometimes, right? And uh, there is a certain sense in which um, many of the objects that are in the exhibition uh, become metonymic for, for bigger stories. So the shoes, what that represents, the boat has become symbolic in our time, but then the lock and lockdown. Mm -hmm. And so you play Isam with these different objects but in my view, and I, you can tell me if I'm wrong, is that whether or not the object is natural history or, or cultural history ethnography, whether or not it is an elite object or a toy, all of them become involved in this catastrophe of war. Yeah. And one has to think about what it means that war en en engulfs all of us in a certain sense. Was well, that a part of what you wanted to do with these different object types in the exhibition? Absolutely. And actually, this is one of the things uh, Sarah and I we were looking at. That is, we should not actually look at objects only from Syria. We don't need to have this geography. We need to tell a story, not uh, concentrate in the geography. We are taking a crisis. We have a huge crisis in our, in our, if you like, in our time. But there is this crisis repeated itself in different places. Um, and of course, having that the theme of seed, um, it's really a very powerful thread going through all of this. Um, of course, my interest is, um, if I may again take you to that image of the boat with these uh, matchsticks, the burnt matchsticks. One of my interests, when I did that piece, it was in a reaction to a piece that is, I have seen at the Fitzwilliam Museum, which was tiny small boats made out of lead with the three goddesses. And this is 500 BCE. And so it is a 3000 years ago, Syria and many cultures at that time, they used to send goddesses to the Mediterranean. And I was actually interested in, in contrasting that antiquity with a object of now. And the object of now is a bicycle mud guards. This is the, the, the object that I made. Actually, I have one here. I could take it with me. <laughs> it's always nice to have my toys around me. So here it is. And that is a, it is a bicycle mudguard. But look at these matches. I found that is the way how in the time of difficulty we come and we huddle together. We, we support each other. 
this is exactly what I am interested in. This, this kind of very fragile boat, very fragile. Of course, it's mud guard, so it's supposed to guard you from the mud. But equally, there is a resin inside that that I was really playing with. That is that resin holds us together. And this is in the time of difficulty, wherever we are, we come together, we work together. Somehow, um, I don't know if you remember, there is a very interesting film by um, uh, uh, Fellini called The Rehearsal of the Orchestra. And it's a, it is a very, very long film and it just takes you to, to pieces until the last scene, you see actually only in the time of difficulty, all these, the uh, composer uh, musicians come together when the place where they are rehearsing was bombarded. And only at that time, actually, I mean, talk about war, only at that time when that wall fallen, they came together and they start singing together, they start playing together. And that was really, I mean, Fellini was always critical of the Italian society and the way how the fragmentation, where there's only at the time of crisis, people actually care for each other. And I feel that is with this humble object, only when you sp spend some time to tell you the story. And that story that is, I was really very pleased to weave with Sarah because Sarah put so many beautiful objects on the table and I was dizzy and read we had, we had, we had, we had so too. many beautiful conversations. I'm sure you had. I mean, it's really great to see the way how your museum holds very, I mean, where it's coming from seeds in a jar to the piece of bread to the, I mean, the whole story of the seed, of course, I have to say, maybe not everybody is aware, that is uh, the because of the Syrian crisis that uh, Ekarda had to take for the first time these Syrian, ancient Syrian seeds from Svalbard and to plant them in Morocco and, and Lebanon because they have to re, if you like, reinvest their energy. Otherwise they will, they will die, these ancient, ancient seeds. So I felt that is really, it is having exactly what it's, what is the metaphor of the seed as it contain the universe. I feel that is the smaller the object, especially in this magnificent light hole, the more inviting you to come almost to, to, to have this kind of whispering conversation with the object. And I know that is, Sarah was really interested in that very beautiful uh, toy car um, from, from Libya. And that was really quite a very nice, nice conversation we had around that, that piece, um, Sarah. Yeah, exactly. Those kind of objects. I mean, we had um, sort of more directed conversations, but the car, for example, it just, uh, it actually, I just put it on my Instagram. And so it was completely unrelated and these kind of things popped up as well organically but um, for me the moment I think when you speak about small objects singing together I think I would love for you to tell us more about the clothes peg because when you showed the image I think uh, the audience doesn't realize what it looked like before and how you reached uh, this moment. How so, small it is I, I, yeah. I could tell you how small it is it's that I mean it is actually I mean it's interesting it looks like I put everything for the show I have this is always I'm surrounded by my object by the way <laughs> I did not rehearse this for the viewers who are listening, but I was really interested in the word spring. You see, it is for me, it's such a, in, in English at least, it has this kind of multiple meanings. And particularly when I took the spring out, here is the spring. And when the spring is being trapped, so I am actually now, I am making a performance to do with the, uh, dismantling the spring. And the spring was dismantled. And I thought that is the, the metaphor of the spring being dismantled in, in terms of the seed. When you hear the stories of the, of the field, and that is actually talking about what, what war could make what kind of damage. It's used seed and food as a very powerful tool in, in, yep. in oppressing uh, the, the populations. And this is many of, of the seeds were burned. So I thought that is having, of course, I was dealing with the lockdown, but actually here is the spring being locked. And of course the spring in that particular case, actually, if you remember, I'm sure you do remember very well, um, that actually it is, here it is, here is the spring and it's trapped. It's not any more functional uh, peg at all. The opposite, it's mechanism being trapped. It's, I found that is 
that, that humble object, suddenly when you look at it carefully and particularly against that lock, um, suddenly it, it is um, its scale, its humbleness that against that metallic lock, suddenly the metallic lock look much bigger than it is. Yeah, what amazed me is how you actually, sorry, how you, what, what, what I was uh, getting at was the fact that you started actually with about 10 of those uh, clothes pegs in the case. And after two days of staring at it and thinking about it, you actually said, no, it's not working. You only need one to uh, make the message. And I think that for me just epitomizes uh, what you were doing with our collection. So I want to I want to get to that because Sarah, one of the things that happened to me when I saw that close pick was a sort of alonesomeness. Hmm. Close pick became so alone. <laughs> so so it was in the space it became so tiny and alone. And also because it was surrounded, if you see the case by two things. One, the lock and the idea of the current lockdown and what that means for a certain kind of that lonesomeness. But I think close by to it was a crushed, um, a crushed- Typewriter. Typewriter. Ooh. And I, I, it, it, it got me to feel, sorry to push it this way, Sarah, but it got me to feel about the ways in which war does that to you. How it, the crushing, the, the catastrophe of it, how it crushes us on the one hand, and that and that alonesomeness, that 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 loneliness of the one close thing, I almost felt a tear. <laughs> that is actually you are a very very nice customer, Wayne. If that is actually I managed to make that tear, <laughs> it is it's really great because it just seems to me this is what I was saying that that case, I am using the lockdown as a metaphor, but I am using it actually in many different forms. One of them is called Siege, that piece actually you were saying is called Siege of Homs. And there is two letters in Arabic. When you say la, which is one of the typewriters, uh, one of the keys, um, when you come close to it, you see it actually. When people were saying no, they were crushed. And that, that actually having an opinion, having an individual, I mean, which is just when you, how we have the right to say no. And I hope that is um, when, Many journalists lost their lives, Mary Colvin, one of them. So the English typewriter is in her memory. But equally next door to it, I have another piece. It's called To Whom It May Concern. They, these are a collection of letters coming from the six official um, prisons in Syria. Um, and it says, um, To Whom It May Concern. And inside you will see a very, very meaningful message don't cancel me, I am here. Um, and that kind of, um, that, that is actually the darkest part of the exhibition is that that case that has the humor, that has the, um, the, the invitation to question, to cry, there is quite a lot of in, in that congested, if you like, space. And of course, what Sarah was talking about is objects in their own right, they speak in one way, but the minute you put them next door to another object, suddenly the chemistry, the charge, how they charge each other, how they actually fire new energy and new questions. And that was really the interesting. I mean, for me, what I will remember, inter interesting that you remember that, Sarah, um, that actually it took me two days to arrive to that just one peg. It is what it's needed, not 10, not 20. Not, I mean, I spread thousands of them. But suddenly, you recognize that's actually this is what is needed. Can I read a question from the, from the audience? Please do. It says, I wonder about the concept of the conversation that Islam has evoked and instigated through the dialogue between objects in the museum and the everyday objects that he has constructed. How might conversation continue between museums across Europe where they actively support the reconstruction of cultural heritage, tangible and intangible across Syria. How can this act of repair and recovery happen in a cooperative spirit and through what the person nicely says, through walking together um, without a repeat of previous colonial gestures? Sarah, would you like to start something? Yes, something? that is a that is a, it's a wonderful question, and um, yeah, I think a very important one um, because that is, of course, you know, we we've seen uh, lots of images of, of Palmyra um, and. Um, 
you know, there's been sort of very official um, European um, sort of media outcry and, and attempts to uh, reconstruct through things like 3D printing, but you know, I think the question is perfect. You know, what what is that actually doing? Um, and I think for me, actually, it reminds me a little bit of what I wanted to say about the way um, Isam brought objects together um, in a conversation. Because yeah, what he was saying about not only looking at objects from Syria, but trying to tell a story. And for me, this was kind of an important way of getting beyond um, a kind of colonial reconstruction of cultural heritage. For example, um, something I wanted to talk about more, um, but we are running out of time, is the way you chose. So he wa you you were interested in some in Arabic writing, and because of the actual actually because of the colonial nature of the Tropen Museum collection, you ended up choosing a lot of objects from Indonesia because that's where the Arabic writing was sitting um, within um, our collection. And for me, that was a really fascinating kind of um, uncovering and rebuilding that happened. Um, so, um, and, uh, but I think, um, I think this question of working together, but also working with artists and um, yeah, having this collaborative conversation. So not sort of trying to tell, but to do things in, in conversation is also very important. But Isam, I don't know if you have something. No, no, it's interesting actually, it's really very nice question from my point of view. The idea that is now it is the time that museums speak to each other, because I think that is definitely um, the function of the museum is on the table. Uh, it is a question that is maybe always has been there and more urgent now, because almost like we are not anymore interested only in archiving the past. Almost we are going to archive the present. We need to, this kind of um, energy that is people are really, we have so much in our plate uh, that we really need to, to we need museums to, to talk to each other and to reflect to what's happening now. And I feel this is really great to have this opportunity from my point of view. I would love this installation um, to, to travel to different places because definitely it is the space dictates new meaning. Having that, having that installation in the light hall, if you take, if you give me another museum that is actually made out of tiny small rooms, a totally different conversation will these these objects will have. So it's always the context and the the object, the way how they sing to, together. I think it's a very healthy thing to, to question. Um, uh, talking, talking about plates, Isam, there's a question. The plate from Syria that you use looks exactly like a traditional Seder plate, the object central to the evening celebration of Passover, which is a spring festival. But also a festival of liberation and memory. But how fascinating the question goes, it would be if it was a sign of a mixed culture of Aleppo, Syria, now destroyed. Um, and the person says, P.S. My comments could be about the question about mixing of heritage rather than reproducing fight over heritage. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah. I know that Simon is very nice to hear that is, he is listening to us. Simon, <laughs> Ask beautiful question. It's really great to hear that is, he is with us. I am no. very, uh, oh, sorry, go ahead, Isam. Do you have a, I, I just wanted to say I'm extremely grateful, Simon, because uh, I was hoping that uh, by putting this plate on display, we also find out more about it. Um, so that was exactly what I wanted to hear. Um, but it was actually collected in the 1970s. So um, it's quite an um, interesting question about whether, um, there were still uh, Seder plates uh, being made in Aleppo at the time. I'm, I'm not sure, but. Uh... <laughs> now it is actually, I, I must say that this is one of the things that is, I would have loved to speak more about the origin of things because this is one of the, I would like to tell a story. I am a visual, if you like, person. And this is what is the great thing. Having this kind of display, and I'm sure that is now we will have a new questions. Having that is, if you like, now, I feel it is a starting rather than a finished product. Um, I would really look forward to have a more conversation with Simon about this one. I know for, for, um, for fact, interesting, um, Sarah, you were talking about that toy car. 
if you remember, there is two cans. One is actually very well traveled from Holland to Libya, and it is a beer can. It's from Amstel. And another one is tomato. I don't know. If yep, that tomato one. sauce. Tomato. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's really each. I mean, if one could trace that journey of that particular can, where it was produced in Holland, in in Netherlands, and traveled all the way to Libya to find a child or found by a child and repurposed for his poetry or her poetry, and then comes back to your to the same land for me to for me and for you for I mean to have that object on display. I found it such a very poignant, very well traveled, meaningful object. And I would love children of this generation to have. I know actually your son was around. I wish that is he would do that, that particular. <laughs> Yes, you story. mentioned uh, you mentioned the video and that uh, that I sent you, but uh, that was such a beautiful moment when I saw on the first day the museum was open last Saturday, uh, two small children uh, noticed the boat installation and they ran to get their parents to tell them about it, and uh, it was just to me yeah. uh, fantastic. Yeah. And that toy I was saying, sorry, with just one thing more away that that idea of a child. I mean, I would love the children of our our current generation of children will have that kind of access to play, to make their own toys. What a, what a gift I was given in my life to have this kind of, I come from the volcanic mountains of Syria, the, the southern part, and having that landscape, having that, if you like, um, richness of the ground, the fertile crescent, but the poverty of whatever you have, you have to maximize its use. So to make a toy, I found that is, it's a very, it is actually where I feel uh, it made me the person I am. And of course, it is, uh, I'm sure that is, is the cliche that is artists are made um, probably while they are in the womb. But probably it is a cliche, but this is what I believe in, definitely. There is something here and we, we have to really close, but, but Sarah, and there is one question, is the museum open yet? They say, we know that the museum is open, but the question is, yes, we're open and we're receiving visitors. Um, do you have ideas of how methodologically we will also hear visitors' comments on the exhibition? Is there a way that we're going to do that? Sarah, any, any, any um, thing on that? I think it's a brilliant idea and we uh, but and I actually I was thinking exactly about that when I watched um, the children notice your installation I thought how can we uh, capture this um, we had this idea actually uh, but it's not um, I think it's not enough, but we did think of putting, because uh, the catalog that Isam created, it's a kind of art piece in itself because it, it's a calendar as well. So it's marking time, but in a very abstract way um, where you can fill in your own thoughts as a diary. And we thought of putting it actually at the end of the exhibition and letting the visitor um, put whatever they, um, they want in. But I would love to take it another step and actually have conversations uh, with visitors in person. I must actually say on this note, I know that it's um, in the summertime, um, I am looking at another very beautiful object. It is a soap from Aleppo. I think that is your colleagues are going to have a wonderful uh, summer by making sculptures and made yeah. out of uh, Aleppo soap. So yeah. I feel I would really urge everybody to go to the museum, to, I mean, the museum is a very magnificent place in its architecture, but that kind of, uh, it's just look, listen to the material, look at the material, just touch the soap and make your own soap out of it. I think that I would love the summer to be bombarded with images of these beautiful objects that is the, the, your visitors are going to make and install on the steps of the, of the museum. And this will be a very, powerful extension of the exhibition to have this engagement with the public. I feel that is actually when you have this idea, how much one could actually invite the contemporary and the public and the museum to have this three conversations together. So I, I really look forward to the summer and see where it's going, where this conversation will lead to. Now, Isam, you did a wonderful thing there by, by, by I don't know if anybody um, um, primed you to do that, but that was a beautiful call. 
and a call to action actually for the public to participate in exactly what, where we started in a sort of being with each other, in doing it together, right? To come together, to be a part of the conversation, to, to participate, to smell, to feel. The tactility of making together is something that we want to invite the public to be a part of. So yes, um, in closing though, I, I want to wonder if Sarah, if you have one last thing that you want to say, one last question you want to ask of Isam. Isam, one last beckoning that you want to do before. I have my last points, but I'm less important in this than you and Sarah. Sarah, one last thing. No, I think uh, Isam said it too beautifully for me to, <laughs> <laughs> to, to I, I dare clue. to, <laughs> to <laughs> say. I, but... I remember we had this, this conversation with Sarah. It is, can you describe the journey by seeing the news and actually how you react to it, that kind of process? And it's actually such a very powerful question. That is, I, um, I thought actually I am currently working on, on this project, which I think that is um, we, because of we have a refugee week. I wanted just to, to share with you this actually project that is um, I traveled from Syria to Russia with a Syrian passport. It was only available for six months. So this is my Syrian passport that's filled with different different stamps all around and I treasure that, that piece. Uh, but I remember the first time I came to England, um, I was given um, this stamp on my passport called leave to enter. And I, I just, um, I am not a poet. I am actually interested in words um, and I am using them currently. Um, now, then a few months later, I used to travel by train before the wall, Berlin Wall and after, from Russia to England about four times. And then step by step, I decided actually I would like to stay in Cambridge of all places. Um, and then I was given leave to remain for one year and then leave to remain for infinite period. And I, that word leave to remain, actually it's such a, such a contradictory, such a, such a um, oxymoron, I believe in English it's called. So I decided instead of actually, I mean, I use my passport for many different artwork, but if I may share with you just few words of my found poem and actually relating to what's happening in Syria now. And it is a, uh, the, the, the collection, it's written actually in English, it's written originally English, and I translated it in Arabic, and the collection is called Leave to Remain, a Single Syrian Grain Airborne. And the small stanza this I would like to share with you, if I find my glasses, here it is. It's called Sweltering Desert, Strangers Refuge, Strangers in a Strange land, stateless, citizen of a tent, Zatari, Azraq, Syria's makeshift pieces. They unrolled the map, a defaced map, sardonic smile, return our home to us, return us to our homes, leave to remain the country formerly known as Syria. But the word Syria, it could be replaced of many countries. And I am using actually the question of passport and the permissions and the bureaucracy of the struggle of somebody coming from another places. That is, I, I know that as you were saying, the question of scaling the dark, that actually what is, at least in my case, Daily, I had to scale the dark. And daily, I'm sure that is many of my fellow refugees and many fe fellow migrants, that is, they have to somehow that you need to, to distort all what you have carried with you to fit in or not to fit in. I mean, sometimes to be an outsider is a privilege. So this is what my last contribution was. And Isam, thank you. Thank you to see you, Sarah. I mean, in, in my own thinking about Isam's work, I, I, I did write about it as a challenging work. It is mm. not an easy work. No. It is not an easy work 
not only because it engages with a catastrophe that we've, we've come to know, that we've come to ignore, that we've come to not do enough about, that we feel implicated in, but it is also a challenging work that challenges the very way in which we use language, what we mean when we say leave to remain, or we use words such as disperse, disposal, um, dispersal, what is at stake in those words. It is also a challenging work because it challenges the very way we as museum think of ourselves as ethnographic as opposed to another kind of museum. It challenges the very taken for grantedness that, that, that we inhabit in the present as we um, engage in the world around us that is, um, continues to make others, certain others precarious. So we are very happy at the Tropa Museum to have invited Isam, to have worked with Isam, to have invited him to challenge us. And I speak on behalf of Sarah, if I can, to have invited him to challenge her in what we try to do as a museum. This is the first Isam, but it is surely not the last in our ongoing conversation, in thinking again about what it might mean not to continue to make refugees of those others, but to be complicit in being a space of refuge. Right. The last word that I love about your work in fleeing is that when I saw fleeing and Sarah had to come <laughs> to correct me, I had already written two paragraphs about fleeing, fled, fugitivity, <laughs> all of those things. But if anything else that I wanted, I wanted to end with in your work is this challenge of a hope that you put in us, that there might be a possible other future that we can sketch. And that other future is what actually is in the work of remembering. Because what Paul Ricoeur reminds us, that to remember is not, is, a, is not passive, but it's an active thing, that you act by remembering. And in remembering what we do as museum, is an attempt to inaugurate something else. Thank you, Isam. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Teju, who comes back to say exactly. <laughs> he, he is just joining the party. How nice that. <laughs> it's really a very nice, nice thing to have. All right. Thank you all. And thanks Thank to our audiences. Yeah. Thanks to Juliet. Thanks to now. Thanks to everybody who made this possible. And yeah. we see you again in the exhibition and later on for other events that we will have. Thank you. Thank you, Wayne. Thank you, Wayne. <laughs> Thank you, Thank you Sarah. It was a pleasure to work with you and all your colleagues, I must say. So Absolute pleasure, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.